goodness. Oh, that is wonderful. That is a great word from the Lord, especially going into what I believe the Lord's led me to, uh, to deal with today. Because I, I have, uh, out of our, out of our uh, Wednesday meetings, recharge meetings, um, come, <clears throat> come a lot of... Uh, a lot, of, a lot of things that I say to them and that we talk about together that um, I think are very critical for us now because I, I don't think that there's a Christian, a true Christian that has the Holy Spirit living on the inside, which is the only kind of Christian it is, uh, is not feeling the apprehension of these days that we're in the anxiety of the days that we're in, the frustration, the anger of the days that we're in. Now, it's very easy to understand why many people don't have any of this because they're delusional, they're blind, they have no Holy Spirit on the inside of them, so there is no spirit of truth in them, so there's nothing to battle the lunacy of what's happening in our world today. But those of us that have that have Jesus Christ in our heart, have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and the Bible calls him the spirit of truth. So whenever something is ridiculously false, misleading, deceptive, uh, delusional, uh, you know, lunatic, uh, it, the Holy Spirit inside of us just begins to be outraged. It's just like when we sin. When we sin, I mean, if you're a child of God, you can sin like everybody else. And we probably do at times sin like everybody else. I, I wish when we got saved, God made it so we couldn't sin anymore. But that's not what happens. What happens is he births in us a new nature that is always battling against the old nature. And there's a conflict going on. And the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, convicts us of righteousness, and convicts us of judgment to come. So the difference between a believer and a lost person is not that a believer never sins and a lost person just does whatever they want. The difference is when we do sin, there's something inside of us that challenges that sin and challenges that thought pattern and that lifestyle and doesn't allow us to stay there in that sin. Well, that's where we are now, in my opinion. We are at a point in our whole society, country, world, <laughs> world, everything, where true believers are being, uh, are, are seeing things that uh, we know point to the fact that the promise that Jesus made to us about the days, as in the days of Noah, you know, and, I, I, and that says more than, than I think it says, and I, I'll probably get to preaching on out here somewhere and, and not even have time to do what I'm supposed to do. But, but that's not gonna be unusual, is it? But the days of, the days of Noah, you know, Jesus said when, the, the days that I'm coming, it's, it's like the days of Noah. And we always think, and people are marrying and giving in marriage and business is going on as usual and so forth and so forth. And, and, and no one in Noah's day knew that they were gonna be destroyed until the flood came. Even though Noah told them what was gonna happen, they didn't believe it, they didn't, they, they, you know, they mocked him, they ridiculed him, they had fun at his expense. But when the, when the door shut and the rain started falling, judgment was there and it was too late to make a choice. But one of the things that we miss about that, uh, about that analogy is that how was it in Noah's day? Well, it was horrible in Noah's day. The reason that we had a Noah's day is because the earth had become so wicked that God said, I'm sorry I ever even created it. And, and, he, and he saved eight people in an ark and destroyed everybody else. They were wild heathen reprobates. They were God haters. They were people, uh, you know, look at our day. This is our day, Noah's day, just like that. So I think most people that have any Holy Spirit inside of them are saying, man, it is time, <laughs> you know. It may not be today or it may not be tomorrow, but we're really close is really what, what you hear, what I hear, what I, and, I, and I always talk about it. And I, I, you know, 
uh, I've, I've almost become a one-tune one Charlie uh, whenever I get to talking to anybody personally or in a group because that's all I want to talk about because that's where I, I sense the Lord is, is speaking on and that's what we need to be ready for. And I, I mentioned on the Wednesday recharge several weeks ago, listen, you guys have got to develop a reason why you believe the Bible is God's word. Because the Bible is the only thing we have. The only thing that tells us that there's hope for us in this lunatic craziness is the Bible. The Bible says Jesus is coming to get us. The Bible says that before everything, all hell literally breaks loose on this earth, that Jesus is going to take us away and that we're not going to suffer through these horrible, horrible things that the book of Revelation, among other prophetic words, have to say it will happen in these end days. And, it, and, and we, have no other, we have no other hope. It, it, I mean, it's not the word of a preacher. It's not the word of some uh, prophetic speaker. Uh, it, the only thing that we have to hang on to is the word of God and the fact that it is true and that it is God's word that it's not just a bunch of philosophy and religion and psychology made up by a bunch of people and all put into one book, that it actually is the Word of God. Because if it's not true, then we are of all men most miserable because we have no hope. We have nothing to look forward to. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be hated. We're going to be mistreated. I mean... It, it, it's no, there's, that's no big news to anybody, I'm sure, because they're already killing Christians all around the world every time they get an opportunity. I mean, we have become the enemy of everybody. We're almost as hated as the Jews, and that's really hard to imagine. But it seems that we're expendable, that, 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 that anyone is favored except, uh, except a Christian or, or a Jew. And so what can we expect? And I, I don't want to be too terrible to you about this because uh, I know that God is, has protected us and God has a word for us, but I just want to be real about some things because it, it, it's, it's getting critical, actually. And with these latest events of Afghanistan, I mean, this is just handwriting on the wall. And so I wanted, I said, look, guys, you have to develop a reason why you believe the Bible is true, that it's God's word, because you're going to be challenged in such deep ways that you're going to be shaken if you don't have a real reason. Now, I mean, the reason can't be, well, my preacher said so, because that's not going to take you through this mess that you're going to be going through. You're going to crack you're going to say, well, you know, well, as a matter of fact, you're going to do what the scripture itself says you're going to do. That there will be many scoffers in the last days that say, where's the promise of his coming? The earth continues as it always has before. Nothing's changed. There won't be any difference. And, 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 and so that'll be the philosophy of the day. And if you don't have a real reason, you'll fall for that mess. And you will lose your peace, you'll lose your, your, uh, your anxiety goes up, uh, your peace goes away, uh, you know, your courage is gone with it, and, and, and your encouragement is, not, is, not, is no longer there. Why do you believe, do you believe that the Bible is God's word? And if you do, why do you believe that? Because of faith? You know, I'll I just believe it by faith. Well, that's great. But when the bullets start flying and the, and the sword starts swinging and all that, uh, I'm thinking that ain't going to quite be good enough. There's going to have to be a concrete reason that you can say, look, do what you want. I, this is God's word and, I, and it's the truth and I'll live or die on God's word. And so I, I, I encouraged our group to develop a reason why you believe. Look, I have a reason why I know that this is the word of God. 
without a, with absolute no doubt at all in my mind, in my heart. Now, just because I have that doesn't mean you're going to be able to live on that. You're going to say, well, my preacher believes this, so that's good enough for me. You know? Well, you better grab a knot and get you a reason. And I'm going to give you five of them today, and I hope quickly. I wouldn't guarantee it, but I hope quickly. I'm going to give you five reasons to believe that the Bible is God's word because it's the only hope we have and it's the only truth we have. And let me just start off with one passage and Tanya put it on the screen for us. Uh, this, is, this is a word out of the book of Psalms, 6811, so that you can see that the Bible claims that it is the word of God. Notice it says, the Lord gave the word. Great was the company. By the way, that word means the host of people who proclaim it. It doesn't mean some manufacturing company, all right? Uh, when I read that one time, I said, company? What company does God have? You know? Well, it, it's the whole host. So the Bible is the word of God. We, we actually call it a book, but it's not a book. It's actually a library of books. It's 66 books written by 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years to describe a, a historical history of 6,000 years, and the Bible is all about God's revelation of himself. And the Bible claims to be the inspired word of God. In 1st, 2nd Timothy 3.16, I know this is a very familiar passage to most people, look at what it says. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So Timothy says, hey, the scripture, all the scripture is inspired by God. First Peter chapter one, here's another one. This is about the trustworthiness of a prophetic word that God gives you. Verse 19, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. I know that's a poetic bounce, but here's what that means, that no word of prophecy comes from an individual. He's saying there's no word of prophecy in this Bible that some individual sat down and said, you know, I think this is what's going to happen. But it goes on to say, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of, uh, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So some people might think or say, well, you know, the, the, the Bible was written with the intention of spoiling people's fun the Bible was written to scare people. The Bible was written to uh, uh, bring people under control. Well, I think we could agree that if some men sat down and wrote a word like that, that those guys would be bad men, right? Well, do you think that a bad man would write a book that criticized sin? Some would say, well, good men with good intentions to try to help people be nice and polite and sweet, and good people wrote the Bible. Well, would a good man write in the Bible, thus says the Lord, if the Lord didn't say that? I'm just saying that bad men wouldn't have written it, and good men couldn't have written it, that only God can write and inspire a book like the Bible, and I believe the Bible from cover to cover. I'm just going to tell you that. I, I, I had a Bible, <laughs> and if I had room up here on my, on my stand, I would have it. And then on the front, it says Holy Bible. The front cover, it says Holy Bible, and on the back cover, it says Genuine. So I, I believe it from cover, and cover to cover, and I even believe, I believe the covers. All right, why do I believe the Bible is the Word of God? Why, what can you hang your hat on? Let me give you, let me give, the first three are kind of, esoteric somewhat. The last two are concrete. All right, number one, the Bible is an enduring book. I can believe that the Bible's the word of God 
because the, the Bible has endured everything. I mean, it's unbelievable. Look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. This is part of the parable of the fig tree, which tells us about Jesus coming in the fig tree budding and, you know, keep your eyes, lift up your eyes for your redemption draws nigh. This is, look at what it says though in verse 24. Assuredly, I say to you, that this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So the Bible is not the book of the month. The Bible is not the book of the year. The Bible is the book of the ages. And the Bible has survived kingdoms and empires and civilizations. The Bible has, has, has endured ridicule and Gnostics and skeptics and atheists. And the more the atheists, the Thomas Paines, the Voltaires, the Ingersolls, the Madeline Murray O'Hares have tried to stamp out the coals of God's word, the more those coals have spread to everywhere. You can't stamp it out. You can't throw it away. You can't get rid of it. It's like a bad penny. It just keeps coming back and back and back. It is an enduring book. No other book has endured the civilizations of the world and the ancients of times like the Word of God. Number two reason. The Bible transforms lives. Psalm 119, verse 130. How many of you knew there was a chapter in the Bible that had 130 verses? Oh, it has more than that. Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. The Bible changes lives. Nothing else can change lives like the Bible changes lives. Have you, have you ever heard of a, of a drug addict made sober while reading Shakespeare? or a housewife saved watching as the stomach turns, you know? No, no, no. The testimony of the ages, though, is the Bible changed my life. The Word of God changed my life. The wretch that I was, the imposter that I was, the sinner that I was, the reprobate that I was, the Bible has changed my life. Little people know this, but Charles Darwin, who wrote The Origin of the Species, which is the book by which evolution is presented as a legitimate theory for the creation of mankind. Uh, what a joke. But he went to Cape Cod. The way the book was written, he went to Cape Cod, uh, uh, Africa, and he, saw, he found people there, and here's what he wrote about the people there. He said, these people are so depraved. I have never seen a people more depraved, is what he said. Surely they must be only one step ahead of the apes in the evolutionary process. Well, later on, a young boy was found under a bridge abandoned by his mother, and they named him Thomas Bridges. The reason they named him Thomas Bridges is he was found on St. Thomas Day under a bridge. And as Thomas Bridges grew up, Thomas became a Christian missionary. And when he read the statement that Charles Darwin had made about the people of Cape Cod being the most depraved people that he's ever seen and surely had to only be one step ahead of the apes in the evolutionary process, Thomas Bridges said, God, send me to Cape Cod. And he went to Cape Cod and he took the word of God and he ministered to those people of Cape Cod with the word of God. And later, Charles Darwin came back and found a high level of Christian society there. And he had to bow and confess to the fact that God had transformed those people. No other book can transform lives. I went to India in the late 1980s. And in India, you know, they have large populations of religion. They have Muslims, they have Buddhists, they have Hindu. They have, they have millions of gods. They have little temples built on street corners that are open air tabernacles. And you look in there and there's all kind of little statues and glass pieces and rock and candles. And uh, I mean, it's just packed. And every one of those represents some God to some of those people that just walk down there and put a little idol in their little temples and they're everywhere. India is not a Christian country. Christianity is not a major religion in India. 
As a matter of fact, most people would think it would be illegal to be a Christian in India. However, it may at one time have been that way, but now the government welcomes Christianity. They welcomed us everywhere we went. You know why? Because they have found, this is their own testimony, the government of India, they have found that where Christianity invades a, 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 a community, a vill- they call it a village. A village in India is 250,000 people, by the way. They don't even have a hospital, 250,000 people. But when Christianity invades a community, that it brings with it a high level of, of, of everything. It just elevates everything. They say, bring Christianity. It elevates everything. The economy, the morals, the standard of life, everything increases when Christianity moves in. Why is that? Because God transforms lives. The word of God transforms lives. Here's the third reason. The Bible is a book with universal application and appeal. Uh, The Bible is not a one-man book. The Bible is not a one-nation book. The Bible is not a one-age book. The Bible is good for the first century, and it's good for the space age. The Bible was written to basically three groups of people, Jews, Gentiles, which is everybody that's not a Jew, <laughs> and, and Christians. And even though some of the parts of the Bible are over, are over 4,000 years old, it might surprise you that the oldest book in the Bible is not Genesis. It writes about the oldest stuff that happened, but it's not the oldest book that is written. The oldest book that is written is the book of Job. And the book of Job was written up between 1900 and 1700 BC. That means about close to 4,000 years ago. And we still speak about it today as if it was just written yesterday. You know why? Because the Bible is alive. The word of God is alive. All races love the Bible. All genders, two of them. (laughs) And all of those that can't figure out what they are, love the Bible. Even a child can understand it, but it is as deep as the deepest mind. Let me give you, this is off of a a website. I think I've got it on here, all top everything. Yeah, there it is. That's the website if you want to check it out. These are the top five best-selling books ever of all mankind. The Bible, five billion copies sold. Ironically, in 2019 survey, it's the most shoplifted book of all time. Now, I mean, can you imagine this? <laughs> You're going to shoplift the Bible. All right, all right. Thou shalt not steal. Quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong. Look how far it goes down. 1.1 billion. From 5 billion with the Bible, the next compo- closest competitor, 1.1 billion. The Koran, 800 million copies sold. The Lord of the Rings and the Little Prince. This is a, this, 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 no other book has such universal appeal and such universal application as the Bible. All right, let me give you this fourth one. Here's some concrete for you. Those are all kind of esoteric. You know, you say, well, you know, they're nice. But uh, when the sword's swinging, I can't hang on any of those. Okay, all right, let me give you something you can hang on to. The Bible is scientifically accurate. Now, This proves something tremendous here. The Bible is not a book of science. The Bible is not a book about science. But when the Bible speaks about scientific things, it is always right. The Bible never gets a single medical fact wrong, and it exhibits a knowledge of scientific conclusions that are thousands of years ahead of their time. Let me give you a few. In 1961, this this is not one of the facts. This this is just an interesting little deal. In 1961, America formed its first NASA space crew. It was called the Mercury Program. Remember the first guys, the John Glenns and the uh, Shiraz, all those guys. Uh, The first astronauts, the first national heroes of America, 1961. That same year, a Russian cosmonaut, Yuri Gurgan, became the first man to orbit the Earth, making us panic because the Russians had beat us in the space space deal. 
And it set us on fire, and John Kennedy swore we would be on the moon by the end of the decade. You, you guys that are old, you, you remember this stuff. One of the statements that was attributed to Yuri Gagarin is his name. I'm not very good at Russian, but Gagarin, now, now I think about it. One of the statements he made when he got back from his space maneuver was, I've been into space and I didn't see God. One American reporter quipped back, if you had stepped out of that capsule, you would have seen God. <laughs> when John Glenn orbited the earth three times in 1962, one of the news reporters said, well, they proved one thing. They proved that the earth was round because they saw the circle of the earth. Well, Isaiah told us that the earth was a circle 3,000 years ago. Man, for many years, uh, let me just go on and read you the verse, Isaiah 40, 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out uh, like a tent to dwell in. Astronomers picked up a telescope and looked out into the north and they found a place where no stars were and they called it a black hole. Job told us this 4,000 years ago. Job 26, 7, he stretches out the north over the empty space. As late as the 17th century, guys, men believed, many men believed that this earth sat on the back of a turtle that floated through space. I got to eat something even more ridiculous than that. In 1956, the Flat Earth Society was formed and they still believe the earth is flat and it seems to be a growing sentiment among a lot of people. I guarantee you, if you'll start asking some of your friends, you'll probably find out some of your friends still think the earth is flat right now as ignorant as that is. But in that same verse, verse seven, Job 26, he stretches out the, uh, uh, stretches out the north over the empty space and look at the last part, he hangs the earth on nothing. Job told us 4,000 years ago, the earth doesn't ride on the back of a turtle and it's not flat. It, God hangs the earth out there on nothing. I'm just saying to you, look, who 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, how did anyone know this? There's no possible way for any of these people to know any of this stuff about science and some other things I'm about to tell you about medicine and all that stuff. It's just... Who could write that other than a God who inspires everything? These guys were not scientists. These guys were not mathematicians. These guys were not philosophers. These guys were prophets and farmers and sheep herders and goat herders. And, I mean, how do they know? Bert, let me give you a third one. Where does all the water go that goes down into a river? Well, you say it, may, it goes to the ocean. Then why doesn't the ocean ever get full? Well, the Bible tells us 3,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, Ecclesiastes 1, verse 7, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. Evaporation. They go out to sea, clouds go up, water go up, comes down, it goes down, goes up, comes down, up. 3,000 years ago. How long have we known about germs? Well, there have been many, many plagues throughout humankind that have been caused by germs that people had no idea that there was a, a thing called a germ and they didn't segregate themselves. They didn't know how to treat anything. They didn't even realize why people were getting sick and they just clustered together and had no understanding about anything to do with germs. And so plagues and epidemics rule this world even into the dark ages. I mean, the 15, 1600s. But look at, look, look at what, uh, uh, well, and, and Louis Pasteur just mentioned this. Louis Pasteur in 1865, so we're as late as 1865. Louis Pasteur created a process called pasteurization. Pasteurization heats up products to a certain temperature in order to kill pathogenic microorganisms. But long before Mr. Pasteur, the Bible told us how to avoid the germs 
of a leper. Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Third book in the Bible. 13, verse 45. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent and his head bare and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip. Everybody say mask mandate. And he shall put a covering on his upper lip and cry, unclean, unclean. You know what the law of the leper was? The law of the leper was if you had leprosy and you were walking down a street and someone was walking towards you that didn't have leprosy, you had to pass to the other side of the street with that rag on your face and cry, unclean, unclean, so people wouldn't come and catch the germ of leprosy. God's word. Verse 46, he shall cry, unclean. Talk about quarantines. You know, Plagues have dominated this earth because people didn't know anything about a quarantine. They brought sick people in. They didn't even separate them from other people and well people. And the disease and the sickness has just passed through and passed. And I mean, pl plagues that have killed millions of population because they didn't know anything about separating people that were sick from people that were not sick. If they had read verse 46, that next verse, look at what it says. He shall be unclean all the days he, that he has the sore. He shall be unclean. He is unclean and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Quarantined. Thousands of years ago. And what about blood? Man, blood is the, the study and the understanding of blood is a fairly modern thing, and by that I mean within the last several hundred years. As a matter of fact, even as late as the 1600s, William Harvey proved the theory that, that blood circulated through the body and that there was a circulation of blood. And what was that? I wrote it down in the, in, in the 1600s. Well, Moses wrote in 1450 B.C., that the life of the flesh is in the blood. That it is the blood that courses through our flesh that brings life to our body. And if that blood doesn't circulate, the body's gonna die. And what about blood clotting? I know that sounds kind of uh, elementary, but the Bible has a very strict statement about a child being circumcised. And it's still true today. They still do it the same way. It's a statement. Well, here it is in Genesis 17. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Not seven, six, five. Uh, he who is eight days old shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations. You may wonder why God instructed circumcision to be carried out on the eighth day. Well, it has everything to do with the clotting of blood because coagulating factors, which is what determines how blood, how blood coagulates, in newborn babies reaches its peak on the eighth day. It never misses anything medically. It's not a medical book. It's not a science book. But when it speaks about these things, it's always right and thousands of years ahead of its time. Sanitation. Lots of the plagues that, that plagued this, as a matter of fact, the London cholera epidemic in 1864 that killed all, almost everybody in London. You know why it did that? You know how it happened? The people were pouring uh, raw sewage out on the streets. The people that lived on the third floors would just open the window and throw the pan out right down on the street. The streets were swimming. It was, a, it was worse than San Francisco is right now. Raw sewage everywhere and cholera spread and almost killed everybody in London and that was, and that was in 1846. So, so sanitation issues have brought some of the worst plagues in history. Cholera, 
uh, uh, dysentery, typhoid fever, polio, all of that caused by improper sanitation. But look what God said to Israel in Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, chapter 12. Also, you shall have a place outside the camp where you may go out, and you shall have an implement among your equipment, and when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and turn and cover your refuse. God told them how not to have a breakout in the camp of Israel caused by improper sanitation. I'm gonna tell you, when you get a million and a half people walking out in the desert, you gotta go somewhere. And I tell you, you can call, uh, and you're there two or three days, four or five days in certain places, a week in a certain place. Man, man you could have all kind of epidemics based on improper sanitation. And here's another one. I just heard this the other day, that they have found the, the, the highest mountain peak in the world, and it's in, a, and it's in some mountains under the sea. How, many, how long have we known that there were mountains under the sea? Well, it couldn't have been long because we haven't had the type of equipment that could locate mountains under the sea until about the, probably about the 1950s, roughly. In the 1950s, you know, some of the uh, sonar equipment and some of the earth magnetation, uh, magnets and gravitational equipment were discovered. As a matter of fact, the longest mountain range on Earth is called the Mid-Ocean Ridge. It spans 40,000 miles around the globe. It's like stitches on a baseball. Obviously, Jonah in 800 BC wouldn't have any knowledge of this before he got a firsthand view of it on a great fish ride. And while recounting his experience, Jonah said this in Jonah chapter two. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Jonah saw mountains under the sea. One of the most common, I don't know if I ought to get into this. One of the most common um, arguments for people who say the Bible has errors and it's, it makes misstatements and so forth is a statement that is made in Leviticus chapter 11, verse six. Is it on the screen? Mm-hmm. This, is this, is this is what they use now. The hair, it's talking about clean and unclean animals in Leviticus. It's given all the rules, the dietary rules. And he says, you eat certain things, you don't eat certain things. And one of the things you don't eat is a hare, a rabbit, because it chews the could, but does not have cloven hoofs. It's unclean to you. So any animal that has cloven hoofs, like cows, sheep, goat, sheep, <laughs> sheep, goats, um, any animal, let me just read this. The general rules are only those with cloven hooves and that chew the could are clean, such as oxen, sheep, goats, deer, gazelle, roebuck, wild goats, ibex, antelopes, and mountain sheep. Camels are the only animal that chew a could that do not have a cloven hoof, and pigs are the only animal with a cloven hoof that does not chew a could. So you see, you just learned something. You can be, when you're on Jeopardy, now you can say, what animal is there? What is the only animal in, on earth that chews its could that does not have a cloven hoof? And you say, what is a camel? Right, right. Yeah. All right. So you came to church, you got a little information today, right? So it wasn't a total loss. So what does the rabbit do? Well, the rabbit, and I know you've watched rabbits before and you've seen them sitting there and you've seen them, you know, chewing on stuff and, and it's like, what in the world are they doing? Well, Rabbits are not, are, are not uh, rudiment, which means they don't have extra stomachs. These animals that chew a could have, an, have extra stomachs. And they eat their food and it goes into this little pouch called a rudiment. And then when they get quiet somewhere and alone and they're not trying to survive for food, they, they regurgitate it and they chew it and they get all the nutrition out of it. So. What chewing the could does is it completes the digestion process is what it does. Now, the rabbit doesn't have an extra stomach, so he doesn't regurgitate something up to complete its digestion. 
Here's what he does, and I'm going to make it really light. He creates two types of feces as his food goes through his body. Some is completely digested, and it is very hard and, and, and rock-like, and the other is soft, and it is covered with a material, and when it comes out, he turns around and eats that because it's not fully digested and it completes his digestion and nutrition. So is that a could? <laughs> if a could is something that completes digestion, that is chewed again to complete digestion, then a rabbit certainly does chew its could. God's always right. I'm telling you, science sometimes says it's right, but it's amazing. All right, one more, one more scientific thing for all you boat lovers. All right. 3,500 years ago, Moses, a middle-aged shepherd on the backside of nowhere, wrote words that God gave him about the beginning of everything. Now, Moses wrote the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, first five books of the Bible. Moses was not there when the earth was created. Moses was not there when Noah was here. Moses came along <laughs> much later, much later, thousands of years later. So the only thing this middle-aged shepherd, 80 years old on the backside of nowhere, knows about the creation of the earth, uh, the flood, or any other thing that was written like about, uh, about the earth and about creation and about mankind and about anything is that God spoke to him and told him to, what to write. And he was the human author that penned what God told him happened in the beginning and, as thing, and, and with, with Adam and with uh, all the children, Cain and Seth and all that, and the ark and all. I mean, no way, no way, Noah, uh, no way Moses could know this. This would have been impossible. There were no writings of this. And so here's what, Mo, here's what, here's what Moses said in Genesis 6.15 about the ark. Now just remember now, he's a shepherd on the backside of the desert. He is not in the shipping business or anything about ships or boats. He wrote in verse 15, and this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits and its width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. So for all of you non-maritime engineers, what this is is a ratio of 30 to 5 to 3. Length to breadth to height. Moses said that God told Noah to build this gigantic floating barge that didn't have to go fast anywhere, but it did have to stay afloat, and it did have to carry a tremendous amount of heavy, heavy cargo. And when you build a boat like that, God said the ratio that you build it at is a 30 to 5 to 3 ratio. Now, I know you're going, so what? All right, listen to this. As far as anyone knows, the ark was the largest ship ever built until the middle 1800s. Get this now. No other ship built larger than the ark until about the 1800s. In 1844, Isambard Brunel built a huge ship called the SS Great Britain. It was a ship designed to carry tons of cargo it didn't have to move very fast, but it had to stay afloat and it had to carry massive amounts of cargo. He used a 30 to 5 to 3 ratio. In World War II, shipbuilders used that same ratio when they built Liberty ships. These ships were designed to carry huge amounts of cargo to support the war effort. Bruno and World War II shipbuilders had centuries of shipbuilding knowledge to help them design the perfect heavy cargo ships. 
but the ark was the first of a kind. Where did Noah get that design? I would suggest from the master shipbuilder. When the Bible speaks on science, it is always right. Thousands of years ahead of the time that anyone knew anything about what it had said. That's concrete to me. Only God could do that. Here's one other thing. Here's another concrete, the last one. The Bible contains fulfilled prophecy. Prophecy is writing history before it happens. The world is filled with religious writings and Bibles from other religions and other spiritual leaders. Not one of those Bibles, the Bibles the Buddhists use, the Bibles the Hindus use, the Bible that, that Mao Zedong, any religion in the world has its own holy book, but none of those books have one word of prophecy written in them. You know why? because the writer of those human books understood that if he put a word of prophecy in there and it proved to be wrong, that he would be totally discredited and his religion would be destroyed. But the Bible, with daring and boldness, writes words to civilizations, to nations, to cities, and even to individuals about what's gonna happen 2,000, 4,000, 6,000 years into the future. And, when the, and, and, and God is not afraid to tell us what's gonna happen before it happens because he knows what's gonna happen. In Revelation chapter nine, it is it's spoken, well, and, and let, me, let me just mention this one. I'm not gonna read it all because it's too many, too many passages. Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39 is all about Russia being a power in the last day. Now, for many years, Russia was not a nation. Russia was a state, like Mississippi or Texas. It, be it belonged to the Soviet Union, which was the United States of Europe, so to speak, except it was communist. And Russia was just one of the states. The Bible in Ezekiel, 700 years before Jesus, writes about the country of Russia being a power in the last days. And Bible, even Bible scholars said, how in the world will that happen? Because the Soviet, it's the Soviet Union, it's not Russia. But who would know that the Soviet Union would be dissolved and destroyed and that Russia would become the biggest state and the nation state that causes the most trouble or at least much of the trouble in the world that we're in today. And it's only getting worse with them. But Ezekiel told us that 700 years before Christ was even born. In Revelation chapter 9 uh, and in Revelation chapter 16, the Bible tells us that there's going to come this gigantic army from the north across the Euphrates River because the Euphrates is going to be dried up so that the army can come down against Israel and it's going to have 200 million men. Recently, the Red Chinese estimated their army 200 million. And I mean, they're one of the few nations on the earth that could have an army that big because they're billions of people. The Bible prophesied that Israel would be a nation in the last days. Now, I'm just going by these because, I mean, we got to go home sometime today. But the Bible prophesied that Israel would be a nation in the last days. Now, listen to this. For 1900 and no, for 1,888 days, uh, 88 years, something like that, there was no nation of Israel. Israel had been taken by the Romans in 70 AD. Titus, the Roman general, came into Jerusalem, conquered the army, destroyed the temple, didn't leave one stone upon the other, sowed the ground with salt, plowed it and sowed it with salt, took the Jews that they didn't kill and scattered them over the four corners of the earth. And for until 1948, how many of that is? Somebody added up real quick, 1,888 years, something like that, from 70 AD until 1948, there was no nation of Israel. 
There has never been a nation in the history of mankind that lost its land, lost its language, lost its culture, lost its flag, lost its people, and ever became a nation again. And yet God told us back in Isaiah, 750 years before Jesus was even born, that Israel was going to become a nation again, and he even told us how they would get there. Because, you know, when you got Jews scattered all over the world, how are you going, how are you going to get them all back into that little land, even if they had a land? Everybody around them is an Arab country. They all hated Israel. They all denied Israel's right to exist. And so they didn't let Jews come across those Arab countries. They would have killed them, man. How are you going to get... I you can get a million people in a little tiny spot right in the middle surrounded by an ocean of hatred neighbors that says, you don't even have the right to exist. You can't come on our land. We're going to kill you. Well, Isaiah says, it shall come to pass. This is Isaiah 11, verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. You might say, well, when was the first time? Well, the first time was when Babylon came in there and took Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, and all the wise young men and took them to Babylon. God just had to recover them from Babylon, not all over the earth. So this is the second time. The first time was in Babylon, and the second time now the Romans dispersed them everywhere, and God's got to get them back from Assyria and Egypt, Pathos, Cush, Elam, Shinar, just names of places from uh, Hama and the islands of the sea. Now look at what he's going to do. He will set up a banner. Everybody say a flag. A flag. Our flag is a banner. He will set up a flag for the nations. Everybody say the UN. The UN is the, is the, is, is the delegate of nations, right? It is the uh, uh, referee in any fight. It is the uh, party that is not involved. So this says, Isaiah said, what God's going to do is he's going to create a banner, a flag for, that represents all the nations, not just the United States or Canada or whatever. Now, and here's the reason why. Because God's, God's going to do something to them that's unprecedented, and if one of those Arabs would mess with that, with that United States flag on there, it would be an international crisis. So you can't have the United States flag because if one of them accidentally got shot down or something, boy, it would be terrible. So you got to put something on them where it's not a, an insult to whatever nation. All right, God, think, all right, think now. Who would do this? Who would even say that? 750 years before Jesus was even born. This was written. And will assemble, verse 12, he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Also, the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim, but they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. 750 years before Jesus and they're talking about flying? Flying? How's God going to get them back over all those Arab lands? Well, he's going to fly them over the lands. Nobody ever even heard of an airplane in 750 B.C. And here's God saying, I'm going to fly them in from the west. And if you want to hear something really interesting, James Wooten, just type in, in your, in your search, Operation on Eagle's Wings. That's what it was called. On Eagle's Wings. Out of Isaiah 40 that we shall mount up with wings like eagle, walk and not get weary, run and not faint. It was called Operation Eagle Wing. Just type it in and look James Wooten and you can hear a historic audio. You can hear James Wooten himself, one of the major pilots who became, later became president of Alaska Airlines. He talks about what happened. He was a pilot that flew 49,000 Jews in from Yemen, a little country down, a little Arab country down below. 
and he tells you exactly what happened and what the people said, and it only lasts a couple of minutes, but it is, it, you can hear it. He actually is him speaking and telling you what they had to do. And the way he describes it is they had to do all kind of tricky maneuvers because they were being shot at by artillery from the Arab states because the Arab states knew those planes were bringing Jews into Jerusalem and they didn't want them there and they would shoot at them. And so they had to dodge artillery shells and they had to fly certain patterns and then they had to go out over the Mediterranean and then come back in or Israel would shoot them down because Israel was the only country with radar back then and Israel would think if, you, if they came in from the east some way along that, that they, were, they would be from one of the Arab countries and they'd shoot them down. So they had to fly them in from the west so that Israel themselves would not shoot them down. It, and I, who knows that? Who could have said something like that? And it actually, and it actually happened. By the way, if it, if you can't find it under uh, on on the wings of eagles, the more common name it was called is Operation Magic Carpet Ride. And they flew Douglas C fifty fours and C forty sixes from the west. General MacArthur quoted that he had never seen so many people fly, and no one died or even got sick. This is amazing. The Bible prophesied that Israel and Egypt would be allies in the end. Israel and Egypt have never been allies. Egypt's been in every war against Israel forever. They were one of the worst nemesis of, of Israel forever. You know why? Well, do you, remember, do you remember Isaac's boys? Abraham, Isaac, and then you got two sons, twins, Esau and Jacob. Jacob steals the blessing and, and, he, and, and, and he's the father of Israel. And Esau goes down to Africa and becomes the father of Egypt. So it's Esau and Jacob. That's what it's all about. And the Bible said that when the end times come and all the nations of the earth come against tiny Israel, that Egypt will not be one of them. It's Genesis 33 verses one through four. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this, I'm gonna quit. I've got a bunch more, but I mean, hey, it's time to go. Now, Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him 400 men. Now listen to it. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. I know I just read this a few weeks ago to you. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last because he was protecting them, right? Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times and he came near to his brother. Jacob is Israel, Esau is Egypt. But Esau, Esau makes the move. Esau comes to Jacob, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. That is a prophetic word that Israel and Egypt would get together. Let me read you what actually was said about this. This is from, above all places, the New York Times. Back then, I actually wrote some news, I think. Uh, the New York Times, November 20th, 1977. I'm just going to quote, and, and we'll be through. Premier Menachem Begin of Israel and President Anwar Sadat of Egypt met at Camp David to talk peace under the Carter administration. They ultimately signed a peace treaty in March of 1979. President Sadat flew to Israel. Egypt came to Israel. Esau came to Jacob. President Sadat flew to Israel for a historic visit. Mr. Sadat, listen, got off the plane, and with him were 400 bodyguards. At 8.03 p.m., 1.03 p.m. New York time, President Anwar El Sadat of Egypt stepped aground at Ben Gurion International Airport, creating Middle East history as the first Arab leader to visit Israel since its founding in 1948. Listen to who was there. 
He was greeted by Prime Minister Menachem Begin and President Ephraim Katzir, old names, who have lauded Mr. Sadat in recent days for his bold move in deciding to come to Israel despite growing antipathy and violence in the Arab world caused by his tacit recognition of Israel's existence. Then, as Mr. Sadat walked from his airliner to an awaiting limousine, he shook hands and embraced, which is that brace, and embraced people whose very names recall the years of conflict that have marked relations between Israel and the Arab world. Among them, Moshe Dayan, who was that one-eyed general, former prime ministers Golda Meir and Yitzhak Rabin, and General Ariel Sharon. Esau ran and embraced Jacob and kissed him, and they both wept. One line of artifacts noted the common religious bonds of these Egyptians and these Arabs by proclaiming on a church, we are sons of one father, Abraham. Why do you believe the Bible is God's word? Only God could write stuff like that. Now, if I wanted to take another 30 minutes, I'd start talking about all the prophecies about Jesus. Because you can just take the prophecies about Jesus and prove to any thinking man that only God could have written this. Do you know that there are between 350 and 400 prophets about the Messiah in the Old Testament? And listen to this. You, mathematicians have tried to create a, a, a way of explaining the probability of any one person fulfilling these prophecies. And it, it, it's so astronomical, it wouldn't even make sense if you could see the number. But I will tell you this. If one person could fulfill even eight of these prophecies, they're 351 to 400, depending on how you count a prophecy. If one person could only fulfill eight, born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, uh, hung between two thieves, uh, you, know, any, you, could, you could recall eight yourself. It would, the probability of that happening would be one chance in one followed by 17 zeros astronomical. And yet Christ fulfilled 351, at least of them. At least the list I've seen. And they're there. Easy to find. Why do I believe the Bible is God's word? Because only God could do that. And when the sword swings and the bullet flies and, uh, and the demons are coming, you say, why do you believe like you believe? Because I got a book that told me everything and everything it said was right. And I don't have to wonder whether that's God's word or not because there's nothing it could be but God's word. So there you go. All right, bow your head with me.